So now we turn to the greatest critic, in my opinion, of the state. The, I think, greatest critic of uh, the liberal theory of the state, the social contract, and I think the greatest critic of Marx's prescriptive politics, his revolutionary politics. So we turn to Mikhail Bakunin. He was uh, born in Russia, lived 1814 to 1876. He was actually associated with Karl Marx for a long period of time until he had a falling out. And this basically, uh, they were part of the uh, International Working Man's Association. But there were differences between Marx and Bakunin and then the, the followers of each within the international where Bakunin thought that you could not proceed to overcome uh, the exploitation of capitalism and, and government in general by using the state, and Marx thought you had to use the state. And so this led to what becomes known as the first socialist schism, the, the break between the Reds, so the, the communists or the Marxists on the one hand, or, and then the blacks, the anarchists, or they're sometimes called libertarian socialists, or anarcho-communists, on the other hand. Um, there's a really good book, actually, about that called The First Socialist Schism. Um, so, about Bakunin, then, and, and anarchism in general, which we're going to talk about here. And we're not really, we're not going to get into that much detail about the ideas prescriptively of anarchism, the kind of society. I mean, we'll get that implicitly, but we won't really dive into uh, their picture of a, you know, anarchist, post-capitalist, uh, you know, anarcho-communist world, uh, sadly. But it's important to understand that anarchists largely do agree with Marx's critique of capitalism. They agree that uh, they think the, the state exists to serve the interests of an elite. They agree that uh, social coercion exists in the form of private property and capitalism, a few owning the means of production, which forces the rest to either sell their labor as what they call wage slaves, or of course die, um, you know, by starving in society because you can't feed yourself. Um, and so they agree with the end goal then of what communism is supposed to be, which it's in, in uh, theory, right? It would be this kind of stateless society where, uh, you know, private property is communally controlled and there is no coercion from one uh, against another. And so there is this kind of free uh, existence in a society. But where Bakunin disagrees is with the politics or the solution uh, 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 as compared to Marx, as to how to overcome this problem of political and social coercion. So what I want to do first then, though, is actually look at this little essay called, uh, you know, Critique of Rousseau's Theory of the State. And it's, although that has the name, it's not just Rousseau, it's all of philosophical liberalism that we've looked at, like uh, John Locke, Thomas, uh, sorry, not Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, these figures. And then we'll turn after that to look at Bakunin's critique of uh, Marx's revolutionary politics in the Communist Manifesto. So, first, at the very beginning, we could say maybe of liberal political theory, Bakunin disagrees with the liberal theory of the state of nature because the idea is Largely. I mean, there are some differences, even with Rousseau, there are a little bit of differences, but by and large, the liberal theory of the state of nature is that individuals mostly exist in isolation and that the state is needed to basically control human beings and make life better because it is only through the state that we can prevent uh, great evils from happening among individuals. Bakunin uh, emphatically uh, disagrees. So for him, he thinks that the state of nature actually is social, that human beings naturally are social uh, creatures. So he agrees with someone like Aristotle, who thought that uh, famously said uh, man is a social animal. And that Bakunin says that, quote, society is the natural mode of existence of the human collectivity, independent of any contract. 
And so that uh, it governs itself, society does, actually by customs and traditional habits, and not of laws. That laws are this kind of external, extra thing that has been placed on humanity, and it actually uh, combats uh, human nature for Bakunin. So Bakunin actually has this view of human nature that humans are naturally good, that we have this uh, understanding, like if you read uh, an anarchist that comes a little bit later after Bakunin, Peter Kropotkin, he writes this uh, text where he tries to scientifically look at how animals work together naturally, and he argues in this text called Mutual Aid that it is natural for organisms, including the human beings, he tries to show, for them to actually work together. That he, he tries to show evolution did not occur through a process whereby individuals were you know pit against one another and then the survival of the fittest, but he tries to show actually it took uh, social collaboration, even among non-human animals, that without them coming together in some way or another, they could not have survived extreme environmental uh, difficulties, including from other animals, not just, you know, we could say, like, weather or things like that, or climate. Um, but then Bakunin also goes on with his argument about society and how that society is natural and that we, um, the way in which we exists, I think, at a more uh, cohesive level is through, then, these norms and, and customs that actually power, in, in a, 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 the good sense of power, in, in the ways in which we kind of regulate our existence, is much more diffuse, right? It, it's not so centralized. And he blames, then, this is similar to Rousseau, then, he blames the state for actually corrupting morality. However, unlike where Rousseau said, you know, we can't go back to the state of nature, uh, Bakunin thinks, no, we can. But I want to bring up this quote that he, uh, the statement he says at the end of uh, his critique of Rousseau's theory of the state. He says, take the most hardened criminal or the man with the poorest mind, provided that neither has any organic lesion causing idiocy or insanity, right? So he just says, take the average person who is capable of rational thought and, you know, improving themselves and and seeing that, like, uh, you know, generally they're not, like, psychopathic or anything like that. So he says, the criminality of the one and the failure of the other to develop an awareness of his humanity and his human duties is not their fault. So the hard, most harming criminal, uh, criminal and the uh, most stupid human being. He says, it's not their fault. Again, provided they don't have, uh, for some reason, mental uh, causes for that stupidity or criminality. Uh, nor is it due, he says, to their nature. It is solely the result of the social environment in which they were born and brought up. And this is huge, because what Bakunin is saying here is actually, this has many implications in terms of criminal justice, but uh, he is saying that it is society itself through, as we'll see, Hierarchical structures of binding authority, like uh, the, the biggest problem is the state, which reinforces then this sense of exploitation. And that exploitation uh, builds itself into the fabric of our society, which then it is not due to us naturally that, like someone like Hobbes would say, you know, where we are naturally selfish and want to exploit our other human beings. Bakunin is saying here, then similar to Rousseau, uh, in fact, no, it is then society in the way it has been constructed which produces criminality and uh, stupidity. Now, where this has actually uh, interesting uh, implications of criminal justice would be in things like uh, Bakunin pointing out that, you know, maybe it's not uh, punitive justice that we need, but instead more um, uh, uh, justice based around rehabilitation, that uh, I, I could take, for example, looking at Norway, where they focus more on rehabilitation, and they're actually pretty successful, where their um, recidivism rate in prison is much less than in the United States, where we just focus mainly on punishment, and we don't actually try to rehabilitate people back into society to uh, break down and get rid of negative things that have uh, they, they have learned from based on the environment in which they grew up, right? So. Bakunin here is being a materialist and saying it's the environment that is then 
the key source of uh, things that we do wrong or bad. But then moving beyond just the uh, critique of the state of nature of philosophical liberalism, let's look at then how they rationalize then coming out of the state of nature to living under the uh, control of a state. So again, the social contract theory, right? This is the, the great theory, the kind of pinnacle of philosophical liberalism. And again, the social contract theory says that the natural right of liberty can be transferred to a governing body by tacit or complied uh, consent. I.e., a state has legitimate authority over its subjects due to the implied consent of the subjects living under the domain of the sovereign. Now, Bakunin here, I think, is going to give the most devastating critique of the social contract theory. I think that of the early modern philosophers, Rousseau gives the best defense of the social contract with the idea of the general will. But Bakunin tries to show in this kind of deconstruction that even Rousseau's best attempt of elaborating the general will still is flawed and ultimately uh, incoherent. So uh, let's see then what his critique is. So first, Bakunin starts out with this kind of external critique of the state, where he argues that ultimately the existence of one state necessitates conflict and war, because it means there must be other states. You can't just have the existence of one state alone. So first, let's look at just the fact that Within a state, its priority because of the social contract is to look over the citizens of its state first and foremost. And there are huge problems, of course, that would arise in thinking about how you could deal with a global pandemic. Because the responsibility of each state is to those within its own borders. Well, why should they necessarily care about the well-being of other states? Because the only reason they exist, and technically according at least, you know, if we just want to look uh, beside what actually happens in reality. Even looking at the theory based on the social contract, the social contract doesn't apply to those that exist out the state, outside the state. So the state only has legitimacy to do what it can to protect the lives of its own citizens, which means it can then come uh, at the cost of people that exist outside the state, which then could justify things like imperialism, the enslavement, of other people um, that don't exist within the state. And we, of course, see this built within the laws of various states within, you know, how Roman citizens were, you, you wanted to be a Roman citizen because you had extreme protection. And if you weren't a Roman citizen, the Roman government could do whatever they like with you. It's the same case with the United States, right? If you are protected by the United States government, you know, that's great. If you are not, well, good luck because the United States as the most powerful military in the world. So who are you going to go to if you feel like you have been uh, transgressed upon by the United States government? Um, but Rousseau, so Rousseau says, or, sorry, not Rousseau, Bakunin says about this, it is nothing but the greatest satisfaction given to the collective egotism of a special and restricted association, which rejects from its midst as strangers and natural enemies, the immense majority of the human species whether or not it may be organized into analogous associations. And so, because of how Bakunin is trying to say the existence of the state in this social contract, which only serves in the interests of those within its borders, that this is a kind of egoism, a selfish philosophy. And that what this does then is promote selfishness among those outside the state as well, such that the existence of one state provokes the formation of other states. So, of all the states, however, Bakunin says, there is no common right, no social contract of any kind between them. Otherwise, they would cease to be independent states and become the federated members of one great state. But they don't. And the reason why is because when you have one state that exists, if you live outside that state, you are necessarily threatened by the existence of that state because with resources pulled together under the dominion of that state, it can basically do whatever it likes with you. And so 
for your own survival, you then have to collectively form a state among people around you as well to defend against that other state. And then let's say there's other people, of course, as well. Well, they need to then defend against those two states that exist and so on and so forth. And so what Bakunin says is then the existence of the state necessarily means perpetual war. Furthermore, then, the existence of the state perpetuates immorality. The state and universal moral principles are contradictory. So Bakunin says, the state, therefore, is the most flagrant, the most cynical, and the most complete negation of humanity. It shatters the universal solidarity of all men on earth and brings some of them into association only for the purpose of destroying, conquering, and enslaving all the rest. If it does show itself generous and, hum uh, and humane toward foreigners, it is never through a sense of duty, for it has no duties except to itself as an institution in the first place, and then to its members, of course, secondly. Because even again, if you want to look beyond uh, the actual reality, uh, if you want to look beyond history and what do states actually do, because well, we can look at the history. And states are full and well willing to uh, ignore human rights violations for the sake of profit, for the sake of ensuring they have natural resources. I mean, think about, just for one example, um, the United States in the 1970s supported the attempted genocide of the East Timorese by the Indonesian government simply because Indonesia was an avowed anti-communist government, and so it was better to have Indonesia on their side. So they supported uh, uh, an attempted genocide of the East Timorese. So much so, actually, that the Indonesian military ran out of bullets. They were killing so many of the East Timorese that the United States just started selling them all of the bullets and the ammunition generally that they had. Why? Right? Isn't the United States supposed to stand for freedom and democracy? Human rights? Well, as Bakunin here is saying again, its first duty is to itself as an institution. And that is uh, part of Bakunin's bigger criticism of the state and power more generally, is that an institution seeks above all else to preserve its existence. And only then, even secondly, will it preserve uh, the life of its members, because Maybe it has to sacrifice a good portion of its citizens to ensure that it survives. The state would do so. And it would say, well, that's because it's in the best interest of those who are left over that they still have a government because a government is better than no government. For Bakunin, that is just some you know, utilitarian argument which he finds, of course, immoral because it violates the individual uh, liberties of all those who are deemed you know, sacrificial for the protection then of the well-being of the majority. But then, he goes further, right? So we've then looked at some of the practical implications here of the necessary conflict that for Bakunin, uh, the state necessarily breeds. But then there's also the metaphysical aspect of the state. And this is, for me, where it's really interesting because um, now, he alludes to it here a bit in the essay I signed. Uh, the larger argument comes from this text he wrote called uh, God and the State. And it's really interesting. He tries to show the link between the metaphysical origins of the state, so the theory of the justification of the state, and that of the Christian religion and original sin. And so for Bakunin, then, basically statism, the promotion of the state as a kind of religion, as a necessary thing, is no more than a religion. The worshipping for him of some myth. So for Bakunin, then, politics and theology are two sisters, he says, issuing from the same source and pursuing the same ends under different names. So, for example... Just as humans most spiritually, uh, sorry, must spiritually atone for original sin, 
where God, of course, is the sovereign of spiritual existence and is the only thing which can right the wrongs of original sin and the evil of humanity. The state, Bakunin says, is the sovereign of political existence where humanity is declared inherently evil a priori, giving legitimacy to the sovereign. Because, of course, the whole reason we need the state is that humans are naturally just enough evil that uh, the state ensures that we don't kill ourselves. And so for Bakunin, you know, this is basically a fairy tale that justifies the existence of the most powerful institution, right? It's the kind of secular version of, then, uh, uh, religious ideas. So the state presupposes humans to be essentially evil and wicked. And so with the argument we basically get here, Bakunin says, of uh, philosophical liberalism, is that liberty leads then to evil. That, again, you know, the freedom of human beings in the state of nature necessarily leads to evil acts. So the state then is the promotion of good through the limitation of liberty. What does that mean? The good is born of the negation of liberty. So that Bakunin tries to show, based on the theory uh, provided by us, uh, especially from Hobbes, you know, but even more so uh, um, generally from Locke and Rousseau and Kant, that because they're basically arguing for the necessary um, sacrifice of liberty, for the good of humanity, that then the negation of liberty becomes the good. So enslavement, Bakunin likens it to, becomes the good, what should be uh, a priori pursued. So he says, human liberty then must be destroyed if men are to be moral, you know, so would say philosophical liberalism, if they are to be transformed into saints for the church or virtuous citizens for the state. So what is the consequence? Citizens of the state are slaves of the state because by themselves naturally, well, they would harm themselves and others. So they must therefore submit to the authority of the sovereign state in the same way that Bakunin says um, religiously in Christianity, people must submit to God and uh, ask for the forgiveness of their sins. And so, of course, we should keep in mind here in the late 19th century, right? Um, Secularism is really beginning to uh, gain traction, and so he's part of that secular movement. But where a lot of people then try to point to the state as an example of the way in which we can rationally organize ourselves without superstition, Bakunin tries to show, no, even then, the state is based on superstition as well. So it's, I think it's a really interesting argument um, if you really just take a moment to uh, think about it. So here then we have the internal contradiction of the liberal state that Bakunin is trying to show that based on the theory itself that we've looked at of Kant and Rousseau and Locke, that we get to this argument where basically uh, it's contradictory because they try to say, well, basically humans, you know, left to their own devices, so naturally do enough evil that then they have to submit to the government, which is going to save them from that evil. That Bakunin says, well, basically, although the evil of humanity then must be suppressed by the state, we get to the argument where it is the same evil humanity which must be in charge of the state. Because who is going to govern human beings? Well, it's going to be human beings, right? At least in uh, religion, the idea is that, well, human beings are imperfect, but that's why we have, uh, you know, God who is all-knowing and who would know, of course, if you wanted to um, argue that morality comes from God or that even political laws, natural law, comes from God, then at least you can look to supreme perfection. But Bakunin tries to say, when you look at the state, you don't have that supreme perfection because... It is those very same human beings who are supposed to be evil, which are then put in charge of governing themselves. How does that make any sense? So he says, Who would be the true guardian and administrator of the laws, the defender of justice, and of public order against everyone's evil passions? In a word, 
who would fulfill the functions of the state? The best citizens, of course, through democracy or otherwise, would be the answer. The most intelligent and the most virtuous, those who understand better than the others the common interests of society and the need, the duty of everyone to subordinate his own interests to the common good. But what's the problem with that? Well, if you say, well, let's try to find the smartest people in society to then lead us, well, then once again, you turn to some kind of tyranny, where you have a minority that then has to rule over the majority. And this is where we turn back to Rousseau's um, general will, where part of the dystopian uh, potential consequence of the general will is that you'd be relying on some kind of technocratic government where only those who are deemed the most smart, of course, can rule over the human beings. But even then, they're still subject to the same natural problems of the you know, inherent selfishness or uh, evil of humanity. And so Bakunin says this would just descend, of course, back into some kind of tyranny by a minority either way. But maybe, maybe, that's where Marx comes along, right? Because Marx says, yes, the state and the liberal uh, philosophy that tries to justify the state is really based on uh, some theory that just attempts to justify uh, a minority of people having power and a minority of people owning the means of production and enslaving the majority of people, the working class, right? So that's where Marx will come along and say, that's of course why we need to then seize the state to wrest power from those elitists and have the state work for the benefit of the majority uh, of the people. But of course, Bakunin is going to criticize this as well. And before then we get to um, Bakunin's criticism, let's first look at um, his, uh, well, let's first look at the, the manifesto of the Communist Party. So the manifesto, of, you know, the Communist Manifesto is of course the most famous work Marx wrote. Um, it's not really a philosophical piece. It was written for a popular audience and it's kind of a summation of a lot of his ideas and it's really a call to action. Um, but you do get in the, I think, most uh, explicit way his argument for how you overcome capitalism and, and are supposed to get to communism. And I, I want to read some of these quotes because there are a lot of famous quotes. So you, you get at the beginning, he says, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. And what he means by that is, of course, whether capitalists like it or not, based on, if you remember the, the dialectical process, right, where you have the thesis and antithesis, well, the socialist movement is the necessary antithesis of capitalism because workers will um, necessarily come to realize the ways in which they are exploited, and so capitalists can't get around this. So he tries to argue, of course, communism is inevitable. Um, another quote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. So, of course, we talked about that with uh, historical materialism. He says, the distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. So, of course, the idea is not that you take away people's toothbrushes and everyone has to share toothbrushes and things like that. But it's that you share whatever produces the means uh, of production, or sorry, whatever produces um, subsistence. So, factories, land, right? Whatever enables people to live. Um, he says, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. And finally, he ends the manifesto by saying, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. All right, so it's a call then to a international solidarity among the majority of the people in the world, the working class. And so how would then this uh, revolutionary politics work? How is it that uh, Marx argues the world overcomes capitalism and gets to this more uh, free uh, egalitarian society? Well, there's basically three wa uh, ways in which this happens. The first is that he says the proletarian, the working class, must become the ruling class in order to win what he calls the battle of democracy. So that basically 
The majority of people have to take control of the government, and it can't be controlled any longer by uh, the richest people who can, of course, influence politics. Second, that means then the proletariat will use the power of the state, because it has a monopoly on force, uh, once it's seized, to wrest all capital from the bourgeoisie in order to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state. So he says, of course, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property and on the conditions of bourgeois production. Now, it would require, of course, uh, the, use, um, the use of force to uh, take the factories away from the capitalists so that then it can be made public. And finally, the third uh, step is then the, communi the communists must act as the vanguard because only they can see the line of, uh, of march, basically, throughout the differing national struggles uh, that would take place. So what Marx is basically saying is, to overcome the exploitation of capitalism and get to communism, you have to, uh, the working class has to take control of the state, so that way, you know, the military can't be used by the capitalist class anymore. The military can't be used to break up strikes and so on. And that then, once they've done that, the people who best basically understand uh, the, the, the movement of history and the conflict and how to get to communism, these people become known as the vanguard. They're kind of like the intellectual elites who will determine what is to be done so that uh, private property is uh, basically divvied up and then communally owned. Because for Marx, well, you can't fight, if the state, I mean, think about this, if the state is controlled by the capitalists, and the state has a monopoly on the use of force, how can you fight against the capitalists if they basically own the military, right? So Marx says, well, you basically then have to take control of the military. Seems simple enough, seems intuitive, but for Bakunin, all that really does is lead to uh, further enslavement, basically. So, for Bakunin, the means to the preconditions of freedom, because remember, uh, Marx tries to say you need preconditions to realize freedom, which would be uh, a certain technological uh, advancement. Um, Bakunin says that the, the means to the preconditions of freedom cannot be achieved in contradistinction to freedom itself. That you can't um, basically sacrifice the liberty of people so that you can then uh, basically make technological advancements to then make people free in the end, right? You basically can't say that the ends justify the means. That's basically what Bakunin here is arguing. So he says, the election of people's representatives, which would then be managed by the state, so the vanguard, is the Marxist's final word, as it is of the democratic school, a lie which covers up a despotism of a governing minority, all the more dangerous in that it is an expression of a supposed people's will. Because, again, having a minority of people determine the lives of a majority of people can't actually, uh, Bakunin is trying to say, determine what is best for every single individual. That some people then have to be sacrificed. And so he says, the question arises, if the proletariat is ruling, over whom will it rule? What does it mean for the proletariat to be organized as the ruling class? This means that there will remain another proletariat, another subordinate class, which will be subordinate to this new domination, this new state. That Bakunin is saying, if, like Marx wants to say, then you have to seize control of the state, and the state will determine, of course, what happens, and supposedly in the best interests of everyone else, Bakunin is saying, well, for someone to rule, they have to rule over people. And for them to rule over people, they have to submit then to the authority of that ruler. So all you're doing is perpetuating exploitation. So, the differences, then, between revolutionary dictatorship and statism are superficial. Bakunin says, fundamentally, they both represent the same principle of minority rule 
over the majority in the name of the alleged stupidity of the latter and the alleged intelligence of the former. Therefore, they are both equally reactionary since both directly and inevitably must preserve and perpetuate the political and economic privileges of the ruling minority and the political and economic subjugation of the masses of the people. So again, the means uh, to the preconditions of freedom cannot be achieved in contradistinction to uh, freedom itself. And so again, Bakunin says, they say, the, the Marxists, that such a yoke dictatorship is a transitional step towards achieving full freedom for the people. Anarchists, or sorry, anarchism or freedom is the aim, while state and dictatorship is the means. And so in order to free the masses of people, they first have to be enslaved. Upon this contradistinction, our polemic comes to a halt. They insist that only dictatorship, of, of course their own, can create freedom for the people. We reply that all dictatorship has no objective other than self-perpetuation, and that slavery is all it can generate and instill in the people who suffer it. Freedom can be created only by freedom, by a total rebellion of the people, and by a voluntary organization of the people from the bottom up. So what Bakunin is saying then is the only way to overcome all exploitation, the exploitation by the state, by a ruling elite politically, and by social exploitation, social coercion, by a minority owning the means of production of which people are forced to then sell their labor to, the only means to overcome this is a democratic movement from the ground up, which is not uh, led by any kind of binding authority. So I'd like to read this quote uh, from this uh, one-page little uh, argument Bakunin makes, because he tries to show that if you want to overcome exploitation, you can't just do it politically. You can't just overthrow a government and then say, great, now we'll transform society through the state. Because remember, Bakunin thinks that you have to transform based on that, that first uh, argument we looked at. Society is much more powerful than the state. Um, that you have to transform the actual social bonds, the material bonds that unite people. So Bakunin uses the French Revolution as an example of why political revolutions fail. And this is why Bakunin basically predicted the horrors of the Soviet Union. Now, of course, Marx would never have approved of what happened with the Soviet Union, but Bakunin tried to say that this would be the inevitable result of a state-led uh, revolution, even in the name of freedom. So Bakunin says, the revolution need not be vindictive nor bloodthirsty. It need not resort to killings, mass banishment, or deportation of individuals. Exclusively political revolution is inherently impotent to tackle fundamental social and economic problems. Thus, the bourgeois Jacobin revolutionaries in 1792 to 1794, right at the uh, roughly close to the beginning of the French Revolution, which, of course, uh, led to the reign of terror. So we continue saying then, in desperation, finally forced uh, to resort to violence and terrorism, placed all their fate in their ultimate weapon, the guillotine, the panacea that would miraculously overcome their difficulties, solve all their problems. And after all the killings, the revolutionaries came to the disappointing and melancholy realization that their cause had not been advanced a single step, that they have, on the contrary, set back revolution, that they have, by employing such methods, unwitting, uh, unwittingly prepared the triumph of the reaction. And this for two reasons. First, by leaving intact the fundamental structures supporting the reaction, and second, that these atrocities and bloody massacres, violating all that is human, were bound to arouse the bitter hatred of the masses, and out of sympathy for the victims, caused them to switch their support to the reaction. So think about that. Bakunin is trying to say, if you have a revolution which seeks to then forcefully transform society, before you have actually uh, transformed you know, the preconditions of society, the material, the ways in which people 
relate to one another on a, on a social, economic level, that people are going to revert back to, of course, what they uh, are, are normal uh, with. And that they're going to sympathize with, of course, uh, those people that they see being beheaded. Even if they think, yeah, these were bad people, it is natural for human beings to have sympathy for those who are being tortured and publicly beheaded. Sobogunin thinks that you can't have a re revolution that proceeds that way without, in a democratic way, changing the basic structure of society by doing things like, um, it, it could be such a, a simple thing like uh, promoting worker cooperatives, promoting the use of uh, farmers markets and things like that, ways in which you uh, realize the, the, the social bonds of one another and where you don't just go and kind of overthrow and try to transform society because uh, people are not quick to change their habits, as Bakunin tried to point out in that first uh, um, slide and, and argument we looked at. So what is the final word then of the anarchist? It's that the state is founded upon the principle of binding authority, authority which cannot be revoked. And therefore, in other words, it is founded on domination and exploitation. So Bakunin says, that is, the eminently theological, metaphysical, and political idea that the masses, always incapable of governing themselves, must at all times submit to the beneficent yoke of a wisdom and injustice imposed upon them in some way or other from above. Now, of course, we could ask, yeah, but, again, is this authority founded on the general will of the people, uh, you know, therefore not slavery? Couldn't we say that, like Rousseau, no, no, you don't understand. The government actually does what you would rationally want, what is in your best interest. Bakunin responds to that, saying, actual governments of the masses, despite the pretense that the people hold all the power, remains a fiction. Most of the time, it is always, in fact, the minorities that do the governing. So that even in theory, if you want to say, well, sure, the general will uh, sounds good, that in actual practice, Bakunin says, it's the minority of people, a few elites that do the governing. And this doesn't mean that Bakunin within, you know, he's not equating a republic to, um, you know, a monarchy. Bakunin makes sure to say, no, uh, the worst republic is a thousand times better than the best monarchy. But that still does not justify the inherent slavery, which is the state. And it does not justify, as well, the authority, uh, the binding authority, which exists in capitalism as well, not just the state, right? Because what Bakunin is trying to say is his ultimate critique is not the state as the state. It's that the state is um, an example of uh, hierarchy and not not like a voluntary hierarchy where I could agree to like listen to my parents or something like that but it's a binding hierarchy right where you know you either die or you submit to the authority of that person or that institution and now for Bakunin the state of course falls under this category which is why he likens it to slavery but also capitalism because of so the social coercion of a minority of people owning the means of production you're then forced to um, uh, sell your self to, you know, the, the, the highest paying bidder for you, right? Or you die. Um, so this uh, gets us to the discussion question I have in mind. So Bakunin has an obvious critique of political coercion, which is why he's an anarchist, why he's anti-state. But does his critique also apply to social coercion and capitalism? Can you be an anarchist and also pro-capitalism? Because there is a whole wave of um, anarchism, I prefer to call it anarcho-capitalism, where they call themselves anarchists, but they reject the idea of social coercion. They don't think, you know, capitalism uh, is is, um, you know, likened to slavery in the same way the state is for Bakunin. What do you think? Do you think his critique of uh, the state can also apply to capitalism, or do you think you can still be an anarchist 
But Bakunin is wrong. It, that critique doesn't extend to uh, society and um, the ownership of the means of production by a minority of people.